Welcome back to Insight. Today's guest has had quite the career, whether that's been her roles on stage. No heaven, no hell, and we never come back. What was I saying? Her iconic BT adverts. Machine. Is it? Marvellous what they can do nowadays. What does it do? It transmits documents down a telephone wire. You must have to roll them up ever so small. You're absolutely terrifying, Doctor Who villain. I'm, not, I'm afraid you brought this on yourselves. May I introduce you to my new friend? Jolly nice to meet you. Oh, my God, is her, that woman off the telly? No, it's just using her image. What? What are you? I'm the wire. And I will gobble you up, pretty boy. Oh, wait, that happened! Or more recently, the role as Evelyn Plummer in Coronation you Street. To break up this family. Just because you haven't got one of your own does not mean that you can take ours apart. And no one's impressed with your snivelling little performance, so beggar off back to where you came from before I smack you from here to Kingdom Come. Are you threatening me in public? Yes. So don't push it! It's De Maureen Lippmann. Thanks for taking time out your busy schedule. I know you must be busy with work, so it's, I appreciate you okay. on a Zoom. Um, Thank you, Monday, Monday. Nothing much to do. <laughs> I just wanted to send my condolences on the loss of your part, your recent part. Oh. Thank you, Liam. That's nice of you. Thank no. you. He's a no. nice man. Yeah, my I tell you, my my colleague Martin Sherman, who wrote the play I did, Rose, he said to me, um, you're such a lucky woman to have lost two such wonderful men. <laughs> a, a clever, the clever piece of uh, clever sentence that stays with me, but it is actually true. Yeah. So onwards. So you've had quite an amazing career playing many different characters and there's one thing that connects them. Well, there's, there's two really, they sound and look like you, but they're also quite strong, independent women. Is that on purpose or is that just the way things have went? Um, I don't think there's anything on purpose really in my career except is it good? Is it well written? Are they going to be fun director to work, uh, people and director to work with? And can I fit it in? And that's it, really. I never, I've never planned anything. I mean, sometimes I've manipulated so that I could get something or, you know, particularly in the early days, but, but I've never really planned. But I think, you know, people get cast with what they bring to the table. And I suppose what I bring is a certain sort of northern forthrightness, humour, um, and the feeling that I'm tough-minded and, and slightly, um, you know, in your face, we'll say blunt. Uh, whereas actually, you know, I mean, I've got a layer of skin missing, so it is quite unusual to see a part where I'm not actually weeping or, or trying not to weep. I mean, Christ, I weep at the repair shop, which is... <laughs> I know that's what they intend, but you know, and as for my octopus teacher, oh my God, have you seen that? No. Have you, seen my, have you not? Oh, it won the Oscar for best. Oh, you've got to watch that. It's about a relationship between a man and an octopus. Oh and it, it's not, I'm not, I'm kidding. I'm not <laughs> kidding you. It is so amazing and so moving and so sort of, you know, you couldn't get a creature that was more different from us than an octopus. Yeah. And, it's very like an alien has landed on Earth, but then it's got eight brains, hasn't it? So each, you know, it's very capable of feeling and changing into different colours and different things and sort of having its way with people by disguising itself as a, as a bucket of shells and things. It's amazing, amazing documentary. I strongly recommend it. I'm definitely going to add that to my list of things to watch. Okay. Yeah, do. Because mm. it's a transformation, not just for the octopus who gets to wait for him every day. Where is he? You know, bloody yeah. old time you call this. But the man, when he goes in, is completely burnt out. It's, you know, and he's he's got no relationship with his son, and he's you know, and through this octopus, he sort of learns to love life again. So I'm going to cry now just talking about it. You know? <laughs> 
Yeah. Did, did you manage to watch um, Line of Duty last night? Are you linking? Interesting you should say that, Liam, because I've not watched any of it ever. And I suddenly feel, you know, that I'm being kind of a bit pretentious in my not watching it because everybody's talking about it, which is what I want from television. I want it to be a water cooler moment like it used to be when I, you know, when Jack and I were, when he was doing plays and yeah. the next, then we, you know, the, 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 the play would end and the phone would ring for the next two hours with people talking about it, you know. Um, but I haven't, and largely I haven't because I'm not really interested in who done what. I just, I don't read please things. I get fed up of seeing naked women dragged out of muddy ditches. Yeah. Um, um, and I don't understand the acronym, so I haven't. But I reckon I'm going to have to start at the beginning if I'm if I want it. Was it good? Was it really good? It was. I mean, good. Are you a fan? Well, I started watching them. I didn't watch them all the way through. I just watched them during lockdown. I just binged them all, and then oh, did you? Two series. I watched it, and I hated the final last night. But then I woke up and I started thinking more about it, and thought, actually, you know what? It it was quite good. Really? Yeah. Why did you hate it? I just, it, I think it's because it wasn't what I was expecting because it was right. quite obvious who the person was all, all the way through. And then it was just a bit like, is that it? You were waiting for the twist. But... Right. Right. There wasn't a twist. Yeah. Okay. Was oh, it. Who was it then? It was, who did it? It was Ian. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. No, the answer is no. I haven't watched it. I've watched Call My Agent. All three episodes, which is fantastic, French one. I've watched Stiesel. Have you heard? Have you seen Stiesel? No. Stiesel is is is. It sounds like it's a really rarefied, um, you know, uh, niche thing because it's about Orthodox Jews in a, a particular area in Jerusalem. Um, but it isn't. It's actually about the search for love and the impossibility of it in a closed society. You know, or possibility. So, and the acting is sublime. Never seen anything like it. Try it. Just try a couple of episodes. I'll, I'll and, watch that as well and call my agent. I've heard really Call well. my agent's great. And Lupin, I've watched Lupin. I like that. And that is detective, but it's kind of not about bodies. It's about a heist. And the leading man is absolutely drop dead wonderful. Um, but, uh, you know, I do other things. I don't, you know, I listen to the radio a lot. I quite like podcasts. Um, I draw and paint. Uh, I've got a couple of grandchildren who I see when I can. Uh, I've written a play for them to perform in the garden. And uh, yeah, I haven't minded lockdown. The first one was kind of easier than the second. Yeah. Are we on the third or the second? We're on the second, aren't we? First one was quite a novelty, actually, you know. And also, I was still working on Coronation Street. I was still working on Celebrity Goggle Box. And um, uh, and then I did Rose, which was a one woman show um, written by Martin Sherman um, and, and a, a brilliant, brilliant piece of writing. And we did that in one weekend, filmed the whole thing one weekend at the Hope Mills Theatre in Manchester. So I had to literally learn 47 pages whilst I was still learning Coronation Street, which is you know, a good test of how your brain's holding up. I, mean, I can't remember McKee's. I can't remember my lanyard, I can't remember my wallet, my dog, but I can, I somehow managed to remember 47 pages and it was really um, a labour of love and and, uh, and did very well. So I might do that in the theatre again in September. I hope I can still remember, but I might just do that. And uh, yeah, so I've been busy, but even when I wasn't busy, I don't really care. I've got the garden, the tiny courtyard garden, and I've got, um, you know, friends who walk with me every day and yeah, it's, it's fine fun. it's fine I've been fine I've been very very lucky in fact I've felt what am I not doing that I miss I'm not spending a fortune in restaurants what else am I not doing not a lot um I'm quite happy in my own little environment really so but I think I should be doing more to help other people who are perhaps not as lucky as I am that's one of the problems of of um, being a bit smug, really. <laughs> I, think, I think definitely uh, lockdowns have made people reevaluate different things, like eating out at restaurants. Sometimes people just go 
because it's something to do. And then I think people think, you know what, I don't need to. I, I can just sit in, I can read a book, I can do a bit of gardening. Like, yeah. I think people used to just go and spend money because that was just the norm. Well, it became, you know, I mean, I suppose the thing that I think is really missing in society, and of course it's different from you, for, it's from me, although not really, the thing that's missing... <laughs> Hello. Hello, Amy. I'm on Zoom with Liam, my daughter. Um, I, I, I'll call you back in, in a little while and then I'll, I'm going up to Karen's and then I'll pick you up on the way back unless you want to walk with me. I'll call you. OK. All right, darling. All right. Bye. Um, it's dance. You know, people used to go, this is even before my time, people used to go dancing three times a week. That's where you met people at the dance hall. And then all the dance halls closed. Uh, and there was still, you know, you could still bang your head against the wall and you could still, but it's not really done. Everybody's watching Strictly Come Dancing like it's something magnificent and new. And in fact, nobody got fat because you were dancing, sweating it off. Ask me friend, I'm sweaty. <laughs> you know, and um, Jack used to say that he always, when he when he walked across the dance floor, he always unbuttoned his jacket before he went to ask someone to dance so that he had something to do on the way back when they said no. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a ballroom of romance, and people just, you know, you knew where you were going on a Tuesday and a Thursday and a Saturday. And now it's all this, it's all online, it's 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 you know raves where you don't really talk and the music is so loud and I think that a good cure for society would be to bring back the dance hall so, you know that's where my grandma and granddad met yeah there you go yeah are you dancing are you asking <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd yeah. love to bring back that I, I, I'm not a big fan of nightclubs and stuff because people no. just go for social media they just want to video things they want to do this they don't really like the music they just go along with it because everyone says they like it I'm just not a big fan of it all no no and what have you been locked down I mean are you at university still you're at university yeah I'm sorry. And what are you reading um I'm doing journalism and media right okay you've probably said that in the um in the text and I've, I've forgotten uh and so have you been able to go in or have you just had to do it all online all online yeah for the so that requires a lot of discipline doesn't it yeah, it does. It does. I mean, it must be so easy just to skive. Oh, yeah. I mean, they've even sent out an email now saying you don't actually have to attend anything live. You can just do it all off your own back. So I know some people that are just so far behind. Mm. And you're look, paying all that money just not to work. I mean, you do that at university anyway, said so she who never went to university. But I know my kids, you know, I mean, my son was at Cambridge at King's and I mean, he spent his entire time on a coach going to see his girlfriend in Oxford. That's a long coach drive. And my daughter, well, if that was Amy, in her first week, Freshers' Week, she actually wrote a play about it for radio, which was wonderful. She, um, Jack took her and uh, got her in her lodgings and everything. And then she said, oh, just stay tonight, Dodd, just stay tonight because I don't know anybody I'm a bit nervous and he said all right and then in the morning he said well I'm off now and she said let's go to an art gallery because now we're here in Manchester we can go to the Whitworth and, and he said oh all right and then that night she said let's have dinner out and so she spent the whole of Freshers Week with her dad <laughs> I never met anyone <laughs> yeah it's a little bit different how I spent Freshers I went along with the whole oh we need to go to this club we need to go to that club had fresh as flu. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was good. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. You're oh, yeah, to... loads of memories yeah. from it. We've always said that they were probably the best nights we had. Yeah, beginning. yeah, because, you know, just making friends, really. Yeah, friends. no pressure. Yeah, and yeah. Well, uh, yeah, and it's a good, is there a good campus there? Yeah, yeah, good campus, yeah. 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 Is anything it? open? Um, No, nothing's really No, open. nothing. Nothing. A little shop, a little corner shop. That's the only thing that's open. Give you your money back, shouldn't they? Really? That's that's what I think. But then someone made a good point. I don't know whether that's true, but maybe the government need that money because of all the money they've lost, so they can't give you that. Well, so Boris can get some new sofas. Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> it's shocking, really. I mean, there's people who have paid for accommodations and then been told 
that they're not allowed to stay in the accommodation. So they've just paid money for a flat that they can't they can't even live in. It's just it's disgusting. Disgusting. Yeah. And you should really strike, but you're sort of striking already, so there's no point, is there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What we're saying, oh, we're not gonna come in, we're not gonna attend the yeah. they, they don't know whether you yeah. attend them or not. So there's nothing we're gonna no. petitions going around, but whether they'll actually get anywhere with it, it's just no. And is this your final year? No, next year's my final year. Okay, okay. Which the So that what would you initially you would like to work for a newspaper? Or, uh, or go I, into yeah. Casting for me. I want to be a broadcaster more than Right, yeah. yeah. I do like enjoy writing, but mm. rather you're gonna be able to do it all now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite scary thinking because I'll I'll be honest, I feel like I've learned nothing from u- university. Like I've went in and learned nothing to the point where I am now. And I've had to set up this YouTube channel on my own and get work experience off my own back and stuff. And I mean, that—that that is the name of the game, but I just think nine grand for what? Each year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be saddled with a debt, to learn nothing. Yeah. I don't know, maybe you should write, maybe you should write about that, you know, because it, there are lots of articles about people at university, I suppose. But actually, from a young person's point of view, you should write a thousand words for the oldie. Yeah. To say, you know, you all moan about your days and school and, you know, you had to lead and do national service and everything. Mm. But I actually want to learn how to do what I do. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, and this, this pandemic alone, not just a pandemic, but the way that you've dealt with it, the way it's been dealt with, is just counterproductive to everything I want to be and do. It's awful. It's just put obstacles in my way. I mean, the only mm. benefit I could see was that I was able to rent cameras from uni. That's the only benefit I got. But then you mm. wouldn't be able to rent them anymore because of the pandemic and everything needed clean. So I, there's, there's literally, I can see no benefits from university. I feel like I've come mm. up with a degree and it's just a piece of paper. I don't mm. think I've worked hard for it. I don't think they've taught me anything. So this has turned into a bit of a rant, but... No, but I mean, that's that's what you want to get down get it down or you know or do take your camera out and interview a body of people and say tell just tell so I can sit, send this to the university just tell me what have you learned since you've been here is that worth nine thousand pound a term exactly. right what have you learned have you been happy have you had a good time have you been any get it all down because one day you'll tell you t- your kids about it and they won't believe you <laughs> yeah I, th- I think that's definitely what I'm going to do and I'm going to mm. use cameras and stuff and do it all yeah. Exactly. Use the thing, the one thing they give you to throw it against them. Yeah, definitely. Because they're probably too busy sitting there working out how to address you with a pronoun of they or we. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's mad. It's madness. Mm, it but, is, but nothing's right. Ru- nothing's right. Nothing's in proportion at the moment. You know, I mean. But we will take out some good things from this, even if it's just clearer air and listening to the birds and getting a bit more exercise and learning how much air flight, you see, is necessary because, like, my brother's been on three planes a week for his whole life since he started to work. WTO, IATA, IAPFA, all of these things he's done. Where are you going, Jeff? China. Where have you just come from? Peru. And it's just been like that. And now he's realised that actually he just doesn't have to go anywhere. Yeah. He can sit in Belgium with his dogs and he can just talk exactly and just achieve as much. Yeah. So all those frigging penthouses that have gone up, those, those big buildings all over Manchester and Birmingham and London, you know, they could be used for people to have a home roof over their heads because they're not needed as office space. It, yeah, it's it's disgusting, again. It's, mm. it's just horrible, the, the way society's gone. It's just... Greed. Yeah, it Everything's is. greed, yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. Mm. Right, I, um, I'll ask my <laughs> question before we get into another rant about greed. Okay. When you get stopped in the street, what are the roles that people want to talk to you most about? Sort of changes over the over the years. I mean, walking about with a mask and a hat and a pair of glasses, not trying to disguise them just because I need to see and I need not to breathe in COVID and that, yeah. like a hat. And you know, you go into somewhere and 
Oh, hello, Maureen. Oh, we love you as Evelyn. We love you as Evelyn. When are you coming back on? You know, how did you know? All you can see is that. <laughs> what was your voice, they say? So, um, so that's the moment. For years, it was the BT adverts, you know, trr, trr, wherever I walked in anywhere. Trr, trr. Yeah, oh, that's fine. Have you got an ology? Oh, that's the original. Thank you for saying. <laughs> you know, um, uh, and then um, I suppose... You know, years ago, probably before you were born, I did a series called Agony, which was about an agony aunt. And she had two gay friends who were just a normal couple who happened to be two men. And I still, 30, 35, 40 years later, I still meet and get letters from people who say, oh, agony made such a difference to my life. You know, I was the only gay in, the, in Carnarvon or whatever, you know, the only, and it just made such a difference. So, yeah, I think that's true. I think, you know... Um, that you know, obviously, obviously, good, good um, drama, good comedy it makes a difference. It you know brightens things up and o often shows you that there are other people like you. You know, yeah. I don't mean in a do goody sort of way, but it, it's it's a vocation what I do, and I I'm very aware of that. That you know that it's it's not really working, although it's very tiring. It's not really working because it's what I love to do. And that's really what I would wish for you, because mm -hmm. then you're not really working. You're earning a living doing what you love. Yeah. The, be the best jobs are those ones that you really enjoy and just just yeah. fun and mm. get paid for it to bonus. Yeah. And the same thing applies to, um, you know, all the charities and things when you get called upon, when you've got a bit of a face and they, can you do this and can you get in here and can you talk to these and can you Zoom this one and you just think, oh, just leave me alone. Why do you want me? Just leave me alone. And then you get there and you are just, I mean, humbled is an overused word, but you are just humbled by the way you see people manage with incredible disabilities and the way that some people are so altruistic and just give their life to a cause, be it myeloma or hospice work or children who are sick, you know, and how much you can do. So, um yeah, I guess life just te teaches you all the time that you're not as important as you think you are. Yeah. But, but the little bit of importance that you, you, should, you should use, the good bit, is if you can use your name and your face to do something halfway as decent. Mm. And there's always a lot more you can do than you think you can. <laughs> oh, definitely. Especially when you put your mind to it and you can just... Yeah, yeah. You get out there, yeah. you, start, you can see... Just different things that you can do and I think that's a lot of people have realized that during COVID it, even if it's just talking to your neighbors a bit more just mm. being nicer in, in, in society and being a bit more understanding when things go wrong and supporting little businesses mm. and the, how mm. the big businesses treated their staff it was appalling and now people are saying like let's boycott places let's that's and then the, then the people who take advantage of the situation you know the people who are making fortunes from it who must be, I suppose, the makers of PPE and um, uh, cemeteries, you know, that sort of thing must be making an absolute cleaning up, you know. And then you get something like these shipping tanks, Deliveroo, you know, the dark kitchen. Yeah. You know, you just think, oh, you are making money out of our distress. Yeah, it's... It, it's... Yeah. So there'll always be those sharp characters in society and there, there always have been and there always will be. It's Blackadder, really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what do you expect the one we've got someone like Boris Johnson in charge? I mean, <laughs> society yeah. would be great. It's it's wrong that he's ever promoted to that. I know. Uh, it, it, it is very... He is like Trump with an education. I mean, he really is. He's somebody who seems to be on the outside, in fact... He's just riddled with privilege. And he, he told us at the start, we knew what we were going to get. We knew we were going to get a liar. We knew we were going to get self-promoter. We knew we were going to get an adulterer and a, you know, all of that. And that's what we've got. So if anybody wants to complain, tough, tough shit, I think. Yeah. You know, you voted him in. You voted for Brexit to pay back. <laughs> what? <laughs> and here we are, you know, here we are. Mind you, weren't we glad we weren't in Brexit when this vaccination came out? I oh, know. Honestly, you it's made in Belgium, my, where my brother lives, and he's two years older than me, and he just got his first vaccination. I've got both. The other one is made in India, and look at India. I, know. I mean, incredible. It's just incredible. 
It's so tragic that just because there's that many, you know, you, there's Bolsonaro, there's Modi, there's Putin, and we never know how many are dying in Russia because he'll never tell us. Um, and now Boris is kind of, whew, because of the vaccination, which is all down to that woman who he admittedly brought in, Kate Bingham. She seems to have been someone who actually can say one and one is two. So we'll do, we'll do three and four, you know, so. But then we don't know, do we? Because we don't know about the variants. It's taken so long to close the airport to India that the country is full of Indian variants. So without being just a total pessimist, I don't think we're out of the water. And I think that, you know, having trial raids is kind of insane. Yeah. Why would you do that? Just let us gradually come back. But no, you're going to have a trial rave. I mean, you can see from what happened in Israel, what, yeah. A, you know, a rave, be it a religious one or a pleasure one, you know, what it brings about is chaos. And they are out of the woods with, with their, you know, uh, yeah. their vaccination. Well, this will put them, you know, God knows what. Can you imagine 100,000 people? I know, and I saw an article in The Guardian that was someone writing just saying, Boris, look what's happened here. This mm. is happened here if we're not careful. We're going to have yeah. to have some kind of, it needs to be more gradual, not just 21st of June, all restrictions lifted. That's crazy. You're going to have absolute chaos. It's going to be like the purge. I know. It's so arbitrary, the whole thing. On May the 17th, you can have two bubbles. Yeah. <laughs> it's insane. But then, you know, I suppose one just has to say that there's not been anything like this for 300 years and nobody knows what to do. So we're all just you know yeah. headless chickens really doing the best we can that's true and what, tell me something on your campus what's the situation like as far as jewish students are concerned are, are they having a bad time i honestly don't know you don't know okay they're having a bad time at bristol and a lot of other universities you know they're not allowed to sit on any boards that and uh sort of there's a lot of anti-semitism coming from the far left so uh that's a big worry to yeah. me Anyway, yeah, yeah, um, yeah I, I, I don't know, but it, you know what? When I go back to uni, I might investigate it. I mean, there's got to be stories there and get, get it out. Yeah, I don't think people my age really know that, like, what they're saying yeah. affects people and stuff. So, I think, I but think that's prejudice, that's ignorance. Yeah, it is, it's all ignorance. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. yeah, and at that age, really, you know, unless you're already politicized when you go to university at that age you don't care you think all politicians are shit anyway so you know you don't really care um and you think that palestine's a place that's you know ever existed so you know um there's a terrible terrible bias uh, at the moment and it's a bit like 1939 so it's particularly galling Calling. It's particularly bad in France, in France, where, you know, on Sunday I was at a rally uh, speaking about um, a woman, 65 year old woman called Sarah Halimi, who was um, beaten and thrown out of a window to her death by a jihadist, 27 year old guy who lived next door, who'd always given her a bad time, tried to take the mezuzah off the door and berated her daughter, called her. Be a Jewish bitch and stuff like that and the courts have said he will not be prosecuted because he was under the influence of cannabis my god think about that so you know all you want to do if you want to kill anybody all you have to do is have half a bottle of scotch really and then you get off in France because there's no law of intent there which there is here so um yeah it's a yeah. cruel world yeah it's a mean old world but there are some really lovely things in it yeah. Honestly, it's just it's just horrible. But I don't get why people just can't be nice. I mean, no matter backgrounds, religions, anything, it just doesn't matter. Yeah. We all yeah, yeah. we may as well just all get along and just. But what? Mm -hmm. I just don't never understand why people target people. I just don't get it. I know. Generally speaking, from something they're talking about in their old background, you know, you probably had a, a happy family life. I'm assuming you yeah. look like a fresh, open-faced young man. And and, uh, and there are a lot of people who just haven't and they're angry and they don't, you know, you're angry anyway when you're a teenager, but they're angry and they don't know where to put it. 
And in a sense, when you did things like Jack, like my late husband, you had to go in national service and you could get rid of some of that anger, you know, because you were surrounded by people who were screaming at you in your face, you rabbit, you know, uh, and you get rid of your anger somehow. But, and you come back and you're quite happy to look for a job. And that's another issue, isn't it? Of course, that's going to make people very angry. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when you're angry, you've got to have somewhere to put that anger. And, you know, we channel it into, you know, I can play somebody angry. Yeah. Um, you know, in, it, but if you've got nowhere to put it, then, you know, you tend to smash the shop front or something and you've got no money. I appreciate all that, but this 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 over insistence on the two great bogies, which are Black Lives Matter and um, and um, well, I suppose trans as well and and wokeism, you know, this sort of um, that's where all the attention is going at the moment, and at the expense of you know all lives matter. That's we, w- what we should be saying: all lives matter. Yeah. And revolutions take a long time and they achieve two steps forward, one step back. Yeah. But they don't have to be at the expense of other people and other ethnic groups, you know. Um, I'm a bit biased, obviously, but it shocked me when I found that the census that we were all filling in had 50 ethnic groups, but not one of them was Jewish. There was Arab, there was Traveller, there was, Jew- there was everything. We were there in religion, but not in race. And that's that's dangerous because if you don't regard Jewish people as a race, yeah. then you can, like Jeremy Corbyn did, you can say, I haven't got a racist bone in my body. Yeah. You know. No, I, I, I definitely know what you mean. And I think that's why plays like Rose that you did and The Pianist are so important. It, it, it's still educating, it's still relevant. It's just, mm. you must feel like that doing the roles. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I didn't realise, I think, I mean, when I read Rose, I thought, this is just amazing. Actually, you know, he wrote it for me years ago and I didn't want to do it because I was right in the middle of doing BT ads and then I was just Jewish, this, Jewish, that. And I'd never considered myself as an ethnic actress. I left that to other people to do. Um, but after BT, I got so much of that. You know, Jewish representation. Yeah, and I bring a lot of it on myself, of course, because I speak up. But um, yeah, you know, it 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 is getting more and more insidious. Um, with Rose, I, this time I thought perfect part, perfect actress, perfect time. It tells the history of the twentieth century, yeah. and uh, you know, it just felt completely organic. Completely, you know, even the difficulty of keeping it all it just it was just a, a lovely experience. Uh, the pianist, um, you know, let's face it, I don't get many movies. Um, and I had to audition in a house in Clapham with Frank Finlay, who I knew from the old Vic days. And we had to audition to camera, looking at camera, but not looking at each other, doing a scene. And so we did that. And it was quite hard not to sort of sneak Frank down. Frank was a committed Catholic. And uh, and then Roman Polanski, of course, the reason we had to do this is because he wasn't allowed to come to London because of this 60 year old uh, charge. Um, and so I was amazed that I got it. Hardly any, you know, it was just amazing. But then, you know, I went to Poland, to Warsaw. Uh, and it was just a, a different sort of job because he's very, he's very prescribed, Roman. He's a, he, I mean, he made a, a brilliant film, no doubt about that. Um, I think it was doubly acceptable because of the good German that played well to the gallery. Uh, but he's very um, formidable on set. Offset, he's pussycat, he's lovely. Yeah. But on set, you know, he sort of expects a lot of, of um, you know, um, uh, privilege and... Um, he knows what he wants and he... You know, I'm someone. That's it. Mm-hmm. He knows what he wants and he's... He knows what he wants and he doesn't, he's not really very interested in what you want. So we had a few clashes, but I think we, I certainly came to respect him and I think he would probably say the same about me he began to let me just do a couple of things of my own 
rather than exactly what we rehearsed. And we are all told to talk in an accent, which is, we don't want any upward inflection. Everything must go down at the end of the sentence. And we talk like that. And certain Americanisms we don't use, but at the same time, we don't want any British accents. You know, it was an interesting exercise. I mean, uh, and you know, the outcome was good. The thing is that if you're in a hit, which yeah. it was, which Educating Rita was, I only had two days on that, but everybody saw it. Uh, Oklahoma with Hugh Jackman at the National. If you're in a hit, the big difference is that everybody sees it. Yeah. <laughs> so the word is out and it's fantastic. Most of my life career, I've been in things that they've said, eh, she's all right, but the play, or great play, mm, she's not so good, I've never been Miss Carl. So um, it, it rarely works out, as I said, the perfect part, the perfect actor, the perfect yeah. time, and it's serendipity, really. So you're lucky if you get a few, and I have been lucky, I've had a few. I mean, I would put BT amongst that as well, because I was 40 years old when I made those commercials. So there were a lot of older Jewish actresses, you know, who were pissed off or just thought, and I had very little makeup because you know just that there was nothing to define really um and i made 55 commercials in two years i had a really naff contract a buyout so every time we made eight adverts for bt they said very good we'd like another eight so I was just constantly making the bloody adverts. And, it was, and of course, as I say, wherever I went, people say, yeah, I got, you should have my bloody bill, missus. You know, it's all right for you making all that money. I, you know. so, so I found that difficult at the time. I think it went to my head a bit as well. Um, you know, I became a sort of, it was always in the papers. Um, and I think I got a bit above myself. But it was the right part, the right, you know, I mean, when I auditioned for that, I just basically did a combination of my mother and every northern and then, and I often said do you want it northern or do you want it cockney I could do you this I could do you that Barbara Streisand I got 26 expressions and uh, so I gave them a fair and I just did an audition like um, uh, an improvisation of, of a Jewish woman ringing the kosher butcher and saying I want uh, three I want give me I want three bags of the chops the minty chops don't give me any fat I don't want anything of that how's your mother's leg and you know it was just it made them laugh and very often you can get a job through making people laugh yeah rather than being earnest you know so that's how, that's that's my theory anyway for what it's worth no, I think it's a good theory I think it's true mm. you can get through most things with humor but it always amazes me, like someone like Navalny, you know, cracking jokes about Putin while he's, I mean, can there be anyone any braver? I, know. I understand he's quite far right, actually, but, um, but can there be anything braver than going back to Russia when you know they're going to arrest you, torture you? Yeah, um, God knows what, and will anyone find out? You're not going to see your wife, they're probably going to grab her as well. And, yeah. Uh, and hunger strikes and you know um it, it, it must be amazing to have that kind of um searchlight you know in your yeah. brain that you, you're prepared to sacrifice your life like that mm. it's interesting it's very interesting to... mm, yeah it's a great character yeah yeah but um I mean, who knows what he'd be like as a leader? You just don't know. But the, the truth is that when you look at history, even as an outsider who never studied history past A level, you know, dictators all fall. Yeah. There's no Castro's in Cuba anymore. Oh, you know, yeah. Putin will he'll be an old man sitting in a home somewhere trying to catch his thumb, you know, and, and he'll go like Idi Amin went. And, you know, but he thinks he's immortal. He's out there bare-chested on a bear, you know, looking like a whoopsie, if you ask me. But um, uh, he will in time. Just the yoke on the Russian people is just always so terrible, isn't it? It so is. Terrible. Yeah. It's funny that you said um, humour can get you through a lot of things and stuff, because I've been reading your book recently, and uh, one of the stories where you used uh, Joyce Grenfell to get through a... When you went back to your old school? 
Oh, when I went to read to the children in, yes. in North yes. London. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd done Joyce Grenfell was another great sort of focal point in my career because I'd always loved her as a child growing up listening to the radio. And and then I did a, this this show called Rejoice about her. And through that, I met, you know, her her husband who's still alive and her sister-in-law and various people. But also, I never met her, but also I really got very much into her spirit, I think. The show was a good show. And I did it on and off for five years and I still wheel out bits of joys for memorials and stuff. Um, but on this occasion, I'd gone to a school in North London to talk to the children about reading. And I think I'd kind of forgotten, or maybe I never knew, that when you're talking to children, you don't ask them like one question yeah. because they will all answer, right? So I'm up on this stage and there's all these little kids sitting cross-legged looking at this woman and wondering when they can, you know. And um, and I said, so tell me, what do you what do you like to read? <laughs> So I said, oh, I wanted to get them quiet, you see. All the teachers were sitting around behind me and at the side of the, of the raised dais. And I said, I just, I didn't even think about it. I went into Joyce, yeah. into one of her nursery school sketches. Children, children, gather around because we're going to do our lovely moving to music. And Miss Bolting is going to play her piano. And we're all going to be lovely flowers growing and dancing in the grass. Isn't that nice? Yes, it is. Yes, it's very nice. Sydney, Sydney. Don't do that. And the kids were just helpless. They were falling about. Oh, dear me, Miranda, what do we do when we come back from the littlest room? We pull our knickers up again. No, no need to help our job. And they loved it and they were falling about. And then the, the, um, afterwards, the, I got a letter from the headmaster saying, it was so lovely, you doing the joy sketch. Um, uh, everybody laughed so much, including the um, uh, and one one young lady wet herself, and she was a geography teacher. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was good. No, she works like a charm. You could, there's a Joyce Grenfell sketch for every occasion, and um, yeah, I tried to write a few monologues of my own for um, a radio program called Maureen and Friends. And they were not bad at all. I did a one woman show on stage and did quite a lot of monologues and. Um, and recently I've been writing half a sort of monologues to my friend Oliver Cotton, who wrote a wonderful play called Daytona that I did it in town at the Garrick. And I just write half of the sketch. And it's usually I'm an owl or a pangolin or um, a migrating bird. And I'd say, um, I don't want to go, Dad. Well, you've got to go. Don't be silly. This is, this is what birds do. We migrate. So, so, yeah, but it's a really long way, Dad, and I really like Manchester, Dad, so I don't want to go. You go. I'll be here when you come back. And then I send this to Ollie, and he finishes it off, and he's just such a funny man. Uh, <laughs> so I'm hoping to put some of those together. I've got a salmon who won't swim upstream, and um, uh, some others that I can no longer remember. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, an, it's become a sort of quite an interesting art monologue it's because of Zoom, you know, people. Yeah. And what, what is a podcast other than, a, you know, there's some really good. I listened to a Jane Garvey podcast the other night about a man who got into gambling through just going to a, a, a bookie's office with a friend when he was working in the bar. And they took out a, a bet on a, on a man, on a, a football team and it came through and the whole bar was like behind it. Everybody knew that they got this bet and it was so exciting. And he just got into it and into it and into it. And it's such a terrible addiction. You know, he, all his wedding money he blew. And then just when he, he oh God, he's, he then won half a million and he blew that. So it's good to be taken into another world, isn't it? It's always yeah, good. Absolutely. I'm just sat here in awe of how how passionate you are, but also how you can just easily get into these characters and these accents and these voices. And you can remember, <laughs> I'm just in awe of it. Well, of course, I, you know, I can't remember where my car is. <laughs> I did a program on memory on television and, and I, I had to learn 24 different names on photographs and I put stuck them all over the place that they told me that if you, you know, if someone's called, um, 
somebody gold, you rhyme it with cold in your brain and then you put it on the fridge so that you get the mnemonic and you get the... And I was learning these things. I got all out on the thing. I said, oh, this one, I was really busy learning and I forgot completely that I'd left the bath running. So one, you know, one side of your mind can be really doing well with the memory, yeah. but the other side is, la, da, ya, and then you suddenly think, oh, I see, my, why are my feet wet? <laughs> Um, um yeah, it's quite interesting. <laughs> really, so I you're breaking up a bit. You're breaking up now. Oh, breaking sorry. up is hard to do. Can you hear us? No, you're breaking up. Oh. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's a bit better. Don't know what, just a moment. Yeah, try again. I was just saying, it's uh, ironic that you were sat there trying to remember something and then you couldn't remember that the past was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's that's what happens and nowadays you know just to get to work on coronation street you know i have to remember my keys for the flat my keys for the car my keys for the flat in manchester my lanyard around my neck which lets me into all the dressing rooms in the building you know my script next yeah. week's script, some food for the flat you know it's just the memory is just so crammed that i don't get too upset when i and leave the bath running or the, or the oh. candle thing or something you know we all we all do just need to slow meditate i don't meditate but i mean just a bit mindfulness you know just take a so moment that you don't, yeah because we're just lucky to i'm lucky to be working at my age at all so um yeah you've started many different things um you and doctor who how was it being was, in yeah. an iconic show playing a villain? I mean, that must just be a dream. Well, you never know that you're iconic. That's the difference. You know, you, you, and now I get little cards with the sort of blurry figure of me in a television set all the time saying, Will you sign this? But at the time, I was living in Muswell Hill and they were filming, I wasn't a fan of Doctor Who, they were filming uh, this in Alexander Palace, which is right next door to where I live, and literally sort of in my backyard. So they said, could you come? We're going to have to do it a weekend for locked on camera, and um, it'll just be you in the studio with the writer, Mark, Mark Gattis, I think it was. Yeah. And could you bring, um, could you, have you got anything that's like a 50s ball dress, evening dress? Yeah. I had my one, one, one woman show dress. And um, is, will there be hair and makeup? No, sadly, no, you'll have to do your own. So I literally put a ball gown on, put a coat over it, walked into Ali Pali Park and into the, this bewildering place, the place where television started, actually, Alexander Palace. Yeah. Doggy. Um, and... Um, Went and found the studio. Someone let me in. Found the studio. Inky, be quiet. And um, no other actors. Just you know, they filmed me, and then they put it in a telly. Mark was there, and the and I just did it like a morning's work. It goes on, it goes on forever. You know, amazing. Do you catchphrase from the from the show. Feed me. <laughs> That's it. Feed me. Yeah, my grandchildren will will one day watch that. I guess they're so funny. You know, they're they're so comical. My granddaughter's nine, and she said to Amy, "I'm going to hug you." She said, "Whether you want me to or not, never mind about curve. I'm going to hug you, and if you object, I shall use the Socratic argument." <laughs> so Amy said, "What is that?" She said, "I shall just say." why 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 until you get so irritated that you will poison me with hemlock <laughs> okay okay you know they're just amazing creatures so you funny. You. they're just very you know they're just very dramatic yes yes, <laughs> yes fun Funny kids, they're going to be great comedians when they grow up. <laughs> um, my son is quite a, an amusing chap. He works uh, in sort of physics, even though he did classics. 
he does. He works with prizes for physics and things. And my daughter is a, is a playwright, a very good one too, uh, mostly stage. And uh, she's just written a really good play about the Mitfords. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's me. Is that all right? Are you happy? Anything else you'd like to ask me? Yeah, that's fine. I was just go- I was just going to ask um, what it's like being on Coronation Street at the minute. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, I've been on it before. I had a different head on, you know, with the last one. I was somebody else. They can do that in soaps. And uh, uh, as I say, I really like being up north. It's very comforting to me. It feels very familiar. Manchester... I'm out in Media City, so I haven't seen much of Manchester. I did go into because there's a Jack Rosenthal street there, right, with a really good restaurant in it. So I have been there, but uh, mostly I'm just on this strange lunar landscape of canals and glass buildings. And um, I have a little, I rent a little flat and I walk across the bridge, and there I am in in Coronation Street. And the people are nice. They've they're kind of quite funny about me um like the other day in the green room you know we've only just been allowed a green room again we do all our own makeup and all our own hair and all our own costume now because people can't come near us yeah which i don't mind um but it just adds a bit to the day um and the other day i came in and they were all sitting in the green room about seven of them and they were all looking at the phones and i said right put your phones away I said, put your phones away. I said, we're going to play a word game. What? Come on, we're going to play a word. So we played fizz buzz, you know, fizz buzz. One, two, three, four, fizz, six buzz. Yes. Um, and then we played um, where you can, um, you, you say something like Michael Jackson and the next person has to say the next word beginning with J and the next person, you know, so you say right. Joan Collins and the next person has to begin with C. And then another game where you can't use an S and you can't use a P and, Drinking games, really. And we have such a nice time. But I think they think I'm kind of like matron. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know what they think. But this, the boy who plays my grandson is an archangel. I adore him, Alan. And uh, he's wonderful because he just, he knows that I like to keep it sort of vaguely improv, improv, like, improv, like, Improvisation. What's the matter with me? You know, I like to improvise. Yeah, you like to improvise. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so he's just like on the balls of his feet. You know, he's just you know. And if I throw a sentence at him in a different way, he comes back in a different way. And that's just I love I love that kind of acting. It's just wonderful. Some some there are some people I probably wouldn't do it with, but um, um, it kind of it's a good character. And it kind of suits me. You know, Jack was there for the original he wrote episode 13 so it feels nice having that connection it isn't where I planned to end up um, but it uses my particular sort of skills quite well she's comical she's a brittle um, and she's vaguely dangerous <laughs> but I quite like her and uh and we'll see, you know, I'm hoping to do Rose in the West End for a few weeks in September, which I'm hoping they'll give me the time off to do it. I'll come down. And, um, yeah, well, come backstage and see me. Oh, That'd well. Be really nice. Yeah. You You'll have to remind me who you are. <laughs> I'll forget. <laughs> but um, yeah, do that. Come down. Mm-hmm. I definitely will. Lovely. And then, just to finish. And you up. know, I met a, um, a wonderful portrait painter. If you look in the Telegraph yesterday, page three Sunday Telegraph you'll see this incredible portrait that this, I met him on a train Simon right. Braden and he said I'd like to paint you and I said oh you don't want to paint me no I've got no bones he said no no I will and we met a few times and he took pictures and that and he's come out with this amazing portrait and it's in it's, it's in the show the exhibition at the Mall Gallery opening next week so you know there's a certain sort of symmetry to it all just Manchester train you know, going to work, meeting someone. And I quite like that sort of, you know, just when you think you're going in that direction, in fact, you're coming back. And yeah, I like that. Coincidences. Yeah. 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 
I've got I've got loads of people that I've just kind of met and we had places and stuff that I keep in touch and I, I think it's great. I love I love that. So do I. I get get the feeling that we've met before. I mean, in a sense, I think that's what love is. I think it's a sense of familiarity. Yeah. That even if it's somebody who you can never have met in your life, that there's just something happens, some bond just happens and you think oh that's so familiar that feels so warm you know so there we are maybe it's just a giant coronation street plot the whole thing life it's the storyline that somebody's sitting up there going no she's had long enough get rid of her very <laughs> very possibly uh, hopefully they don't recast her <laughs> <laughs> i wish you luck love i think you'll go far i think you'll do really well thank you I, I feel I should curtsy to say goodbye to you since you've been made a dame. <laughs> Why, not? Why not? Yeah, I haven't officially been made a dame yet. I, I don't know when it'll be because of COVID. So um, I'm sure they'll spring it on me sometime soon. Yeah, well, I think the Queen's an amazing woman. I'm so in awe of her for her amazing service, service to the nation. And I did actually find the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral, however old he was. Um, I found it really moving. And I suppose I'm still in that state where I'm sort of bereaved myself, so I could identify more. But um, I thought he did such a mischievous job of that funeral, you know, the yeah. Land Rover and the... Just, there was just a little sort of bit of Duke in there somehow. Oh, I, almost, uh, yeah. I hope my funeral's like that and it's quirky and it's got bits of me in it because that's what a funeral yeah. is a celebration isn't it so yeah it should be yes yeah. so of your life and what you've done yeah yeah okay thank are you. we done yeah thank you a pleasure bye <laughs>